We've all heard of those cases where a couple breaks up, but the person on the receiving end of the breakup just can't handle it. They become jealous, possessive, and obsessive to the point where they no longer want their ex-partner to be happy if it means they're with someone else. They would rather them just be with no one than someone who isn't them. So this person lashes out and hurts them. But in this case, we see an entire family who just join in on one person's rage and madness to the point where six people are willing to risk it all just to get revenge on a teenager who did absolutely nothing wrong. This is a case that involves an unexpected attack on someone who was completely defenseless carried out by people who armed themselves with all sorts of weapons. I am a true believer that everyone should have some sort of tool to defend themselves with if something like this happens, so that is why I'm partnering with Pain Safari, the sponsor of today's video. Pain Safari believes in empowering individuals to take control of their own safety by providing innovative self-defense products that offer both practicality and offensiveness. One of my favorite products from them that does exactly that is their Shockwave Torch. The Shockwave Torch is a powerful, non-lethal defense tool and a 1,000-hour super bright LED lifetime bulb flashlight. Weighing just 4 ounces and fitting right into your hand, the Shockwave Torch is the perfect tool to bring with you on the go. You can carry it anywhere you go, whether you put it in your pocket or your purse or keep it in your car. It has a super bright LED flashlight that is bright enough to serve as a deterrent if shined directly in the attacker's face to give yourself a few extra seconds to get away. But if that isn't enough, the stun feature generates 2 amps, 9,000 volts, and 1.5 microcoulombs of power. Many of you know that I am passionate about self-defense, which is why I carry this with me everywhere I go. It's a very reliable and durable tool. It's shockproof and water resistant. It has a simple LED power gauge to easily check the charge level to make sure it's always ready to go. And if it needs to charge, it has wireless charging capabilities. I hope I never have to use this, but if I ever find myself in a situation, I'm glad I have it with me at all times. I am so excited to tell you about the giveaway that Paint Safari is doing right now. Paint Safari is giving one of you a $5,000 dream vacation for anyone who purchases a shockwave torch through this month of July. To enter, all you have to do is follow the link in my description box and purchase your shockwave torch. Now you can be prepared anywhere you go while excitingly awaiting to hear if you are chosen for a relaxing dream vacation. Thank you again so much to Pain Safari for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the heartbreaking case of Jay Sewell. 18-year-old Jay Sewell lived in an area in Lee in Southeast England with his parents and three siblings, all of whom he loved deeply. Jay was described by his mother as being fun and outgoing. He had a strong personality, he was always happy, and was all about having fun. When he was a child, he was diagnosed with dyslexia, which led him to struggling a lot in school. But despite that, he always tried his very best and what he struggled with in his academic abilities, he fully made up for in his social skills and overall determination. If there was something he set his mind to, he would find a way to do it. He was also popular with a lot of friends. He had a strong presence and he was the gel that kept his group of friends together, always being the one who wanted to make plans and have a good time. If there was a party going on, he was invited and when he showed up, everyone knew he was there and was happy to see him. He always lived in the moment just as any teenager his age does. Jay was also described as being fearless. Being so young, there were still so many things he wanted to do in life. He wanted to try skydiving someday. He was also into riding bikes and making big jumps. More recently, he had grown an interest in boxing, signing up for classes that were set to start shortly after his death. He was also in the process of getting his passport so he could get away and travel with his best friends. He was just this energetic, fun-loving, passionate young man who people loved to be around. By December 7th, 2018, Jay started dating 20-year-old Gemma Hodder. According to family members, Jay had met Gemma through some friends at a pub one night, and from there, the two connected and started a relationship. It was still a very, very new relationship that had only been going on for a matter of days before they started running into trouble. 
About two months before Jay and Gemma met, Gemma had officially split up with her long-term boyfriend, 20-year-old Daniel Grogan. The two had dated on and off for two years before Gemma finally decided to break things off with Daniel for good. But of course, this was something that Daniel was not happy with. He could not let Gemma go. It turned out that when Gemma first broke up with Daniel, he responded by physically dragging her, kicking her, and punching her. He threatened her and her family, showing that he clearly was not going to let her go without a fight. This led to Gemma pretty much cutting off contact with him so she could be free from his abuse and not have him around to threaten her or her family any longer. For the months that followed the breakup, Daniel continued to have a very hard time accepting that things were over. He started sending her threatening voice messages and Snapchat videos, threatening her as well as his own life. So a few weeks after the breakup, Gemma did agree to meet back up with Daniel to talk things through. But once she got to his place, he jumped in her car and locked himself in, refusing to get out. He then tried grabbing her phone from her, but wasn't able to. He then got out of the car and stormed away, saying that he was going to kill himself. After storming away, he came back and made his way back to her car before she had a chance to lock it or get away. Once again, with him in the car, they got into another argument when he tried grabbing her phone from her because he was suspicious that she was already dating someone else. This time, he bit her in the forehead in the heat of it. Once again, she was eventually able to get him out of the car and she left. After this whole thing, in early December, Daniel sent Gemma a 10 second long video of himself holding up a scalpel to his own neck, threatening suicide. This prompted Gemma to call Daniel's sister and his mom to let them know that he was a danger to himself because, of course, when you date someone for that long, even if you are broken up, you still care about them. She obviously didn't want to see Daniel hurt himself, even if she didn't want to be with him anymore, so she wanted to make sure he was safe. After this incident, she agreed to meet up with him once again to try and talk things through. She picked him up in her car and parked near a train station to talk in the car. However, as you could have expected, this did not go well. Turns out he had been watching her the night before and found out that she went out without telling him. They had a huge fight about this, so Gemma started driving him back to drop him off. But as she did that, he pulled the emergency brake and caused her to swerve, almost causing an accident. Thankfully, she was okay and Daniel did end up leaving after Gemma called his sister to come get him. At that time, his sister said that the two shouldn't be in a relationship, that this whole thing isn't healthy for either of them, that they just need to take some time apart. At this point, Daniel was suspicious that Gemma had been seeing someone else, but it wasn't confirmed until around December 8th or 9th. Once it was confirmed to Daniel that Gemma was moved on and seeing someone else, he just went berserk as if his other behaviors weren't wild enough. Again, Daniel could not handle the thought of Gemma being happy with anybody else. He grew more and more jealous, possessive, and vengeful as the days went on. After finding out that Gemma was dating Jay, he started sending literally hundreds of voice messages and text messages to her saying that he was in love with her, he couldn't live without her, and how they could have a future together. When she made it clear that she was completely done with him and no longer loved him, this progressed to calling her names, threatening not just her but also Jay and other friends and family. He even sent messages saying racial slurs and all sorts of other nasty things in these messages. He was going out of his way to come up with the nastiest, most threatening things he could to try and scare Gemma into getting back together with him. Some of the threats that he made against Jay included texts saying, quote, I'll put a bullet through his head on my niece's life. That's a promise. I swear on everything. He's a dead man, Gemma. In another text, he wrote, I'm going to smash his house up and set it on fire and I'm going to stab the shit out of him. I promise you on my niece's life. Then he wrote, watch when this boy dies. Someone has to die and you're going to hate yourself when someone gets killed for this. Some innocent kid. There was another text saying, I'll send 30 
and words through your front door, you nerd. Now, at first, Gemma was not responding to any of these text messages. She didn't want to engage, but eventually she did respond saying that Jay isn't scared of him, basically saying that she isn't going to let him make these threats and ruin her relationship. By December 10th, 2018, at around 6.20 a.m., Daniel sent Gemma another string of texts. He wrote, I'm going to stamp all over you. You're an effing little slag man you wrong in. A half hour later, he wrote, watch when someone gets deaded off over this. This was followed with, and it will be Jay. I promise you. That same day, Gemma's mother was warning her not to engage with Daniel at all. He is clearly obsessive, unstable, and unpredictable. He's highly emotional and volatile. Not someone she should be even entertaining. Not someone she should even be responding to. But Gemma's lack of response did not stop Daniel. Later that day, he texted Gemma, quote, He will die or eat through a straw for six months. Finally, Gemma did respond saying, quote, you're the least bait kid in the world. All they got to do is look at Jay's phone and know who's behind it. Then that same day, Daniel had actually reached out to Jay saying that he knew the school his little sister Chloe went to. He said that he was going to get some of his gang friends to ambush her at school and assault her. Then he threatened to burn his house down with his family inside. This threat against Jay's family was Jay's last straw. To him, it's one thing to threaten Gemma. It's one thing to threaten him. But to go as far as threatening his little sister and then his entire family, that was enough. At this point, obviously, both Gemma and Jay were getting sick of the threats and the nonstop harassment. Jay most likely believed that Daniel was just spewing all of this hate, all of this poison in hopes of intimidating him, but never thought that he would actually act on any of it. It was all just Daniel trying to talk this big game and trying to ruin their relationship, but Jay wasn't having it. So finally, by December 11th, Gemma and Jay contacted Daniel and agreed to meet up with him in person so they could talk it out and hopefully get the harassment to stop. They just wanted to put an end to this whole thing and move on with their lives. At first, Daniel asked Gemma to come over so that they could speak at his home, but Gemma was more careful than that. She wanted to meet somewhere more neutral in hopes that it would just be Daniel and them without his family interfering with everything. Obviously, after dating him for two years, she knew him and his family pretty well, so she was worried that if she went to his house, that his family would get involved and just make things even messier than it already was. So that evening of December 11th, she asked Daniel to meet her in Allwood Crescent across the railway bridge in Altam, which is a few blocks away from where Daniel lived in Lee. They agreed, and Gemma, Jay, along with Jay's friend, Charlie, all headed in that direction. Just before 10 p.m., Gemma sent Daniel a text to let him know that they were there. Now, knowing the state of mind Daniel was in, especially when she had met him in the past, and knowing the kind of person he was, Gemma knew that this was not going to be a pleasant conversation. That is why her and Jay brought Charlie along with them to ensure that if there was an argument, things didn't get out of hand. But what Daniel actually had planned for that evening was far beyond anything Gemma or Jay could have expected or prepared for. According to CCTV footage later recovered from the area, as Gemma, Jay, and Charlie were headed towards the meeting point, Daniel and several members of his family all gathered and lied in wait for their arrival. On this footage, we see Daniel's phone screen light up at the same time that we know Gemma sent him a text notifying him of their arrival. Just as he gets that message, we then see several people start running in the direction of Gemma's car. A few minutes after that is captured on CCTV footage, emergency services receive several calls regarding a massive fight that was happening in Altam. The callers were saying that there was this massive group of people going around carrying weapons and attacking people and cars. By the time officers arrived, they found no one in the area. Whoever this big group was had fled, and whoever the victims were had also left the area, 
but the perpetrators left behind quite the scene. Investigators found all sorts of weapons left in the area. There was a hammer on the road lying right next to some broken glass. There were pieces of wood lying all around that were torn from nearby fences. There were bricks lying all around. Immediately, investigators taped off the scene to try and control the area as best as possible. They wanted to preserve any evidence they could because really, at this point, they had no idea what to expect. As that was happening, officers received another call regarding two teenage stabbing victims who had recently arrived to the hospital near Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The two victims would later be identified as 18-year-old Jay Sewell and his friend, 18-year-old Charlie. At first, the families of both young victims were notified that they were alive and stable. Soon, Jay's mother, Sharon, arrived to the hospital with Jay's youngest two siblings to see him. However, when they got there, Jay's family received the worst possible news they could have imagined. Jay wasn't alive and stable. He had actually just tragically died from his stabbing injuries. He had been brutally murdered. Of course, after Jay's death, his body was transported to the medical examiner for an autopsy. They found that Jay had been stabbed a total of three times, two times to his legs and one time to his chest. The fatal stab wound was the one to the chest, which penetrated 12 centimeters deep and severed his aorta. Meanwhile, Chris remained in the hospital in critical condition after suffering a stab wound to his back. Thankfully though, Chris did ultimately survive his injuries. As all of this was happening, things started ramping up because of course, this pretty quickly turned into a homicide investigation. Pretty quickly, Jay's girlfriend, Gemma, came forward to police to tell them exactly what happened that night. She told police that she planned this meetup with her ex, Daniel, so that she could talk things through with him and get him to stop harassing her and her boyfriend. But when they got there, he, along with several other people, all ambushed her and Jay and attacked them. She identified some members of Daniel's family who were present, but she didn't know exactly how many people were there. She said there could have been up to 12 of them involved. It was just such a frenzied attack, such a chaotic situation that she really had no idea what really happened. Based on this, police immediately went to the home where Daniel lived and arrest any and all family members present there. When they arrived, according to officers on scene, it was clear that the family was shaken up and nervous. At that point, they removed Daniel's parents, 54-year-old Anne and Robert Grogan, Anne was reportedly witnessed carrying a knife at the scene while Robert was seen swinging an axe. Also at the home were Daniel's sister, 29-year-old Francisca Grogan, and her partner, 32-year-old Jamie Bennett, both of whom were seen carrying hammers. Lastly, at the home, they found Daniel's cousin, 19-year-old Liam Hickey. But there were two others who were known to be at the scene who were nowhere to be found. That included Daniel Grogan and his best friend, 26-year-old Charlie Dudley. Beyond that, investigators felt that there could have been even more suspects at large, but they were at least able to take in those four individuals to talk to them and hopefully lift some evidence off of them for the time being. They swabbed their clothes and hands for possible blood and DNA. They took fingernail clippings and anything else they felt would be useful. They also took each suspect in for questioning, but... Every single person said absolutely nothing. Some of them, particularly Anne, looked very nervous and frazzled, but they all clearly had a prior discussion where they all agreed to say nothing to investigators. So these initial interviews were absolutely useless. At this point, what investigators knew was that Jay and Chris were stabbed. They knew from Gemma's account that Daniel was the center of this because he was the one they were all there to meet. They had also been able to examine the cell phone data from Chris, Jay, and everyone that was arrested at that point. Again, they found the hundreds of text messages from Daniel to Jay and Gemma, all of which showed how clearly volatile Daniel was. He harassed both of them and made it obvious how he felt towards them. 
investigators saw a clear picture of a man who grew more and more restless and violent as the days passed with Gemma in this new relationship. He was obsessive, emotional, and couldn't handle the thought of Gemma being with anybody but him. They also saw that cell phones belonging to Daniel, Charlie, Anne, Robert, Liam, Francesca, and Jamie were all at the location of the attack at the same time that Jay was attacked. Then, using this, that is when police found that CCTV footage that showed the entire group running up to the car to initiate the attack. Officers described it as a pack of wolves, all going after one innocent victim. For the days following the murder, the manhunt for Daniel and Charlie continued, but thankfully, it did not last long. As things in the case started to heat up, Daniel Grogan actually turned himself into police. And once he was in custody, police were able to track down Charlie Dudley and take him into the station as well. Now, finally, police had all six suspects in their custody. Of course, none of the suspects would talk. Nobody was giving the others up, but after giving Gemma some time to make sense of everything for herself, she was able to give a more clear picture of what happened on the night of December 11th, because obviously when they first questioned her, she was still in a state of shock. She was still pretty panicked from the chaos of everything. So after taking some time and collecting herself, she was able to talk a lot about what happened. So clearly, Daniel had been stewing in his jealousy and rage after the breakup. Again, as we know from earlier, he had a history of being physically violent with Gemma after the initial split. This just got worse after she started a new relationship. Most likely, as he was getting angrier and angrier and making these threats, he was talking to his own family members about the situation and getting them all heated about the whole thing. Then, he started to formulate a plan to attack Jay with the help of his family. Clearly, being hot-headed and rageful runs in the family because somehow he was able to convince five family members and a friend to join in on this plot to kill or seriously injure a man who had been dating his ex for four days. He lured Gemma and Jay to the spot where all of them were lying in wait. According to Gemma, as they got out of the car to meet with Daniel, they saw the group all running at them carrying various weapons. She saw Robert yielding an axe while Anne was carrying a knife. As the group ran up to them, Gemma tried to talk them down and resonate with them, but it didn't work. Gemma tried yelling to Anne who she thought she could trust, but Anne just shoved her down to the ground. Jay, Charlie, and Gemma then ran away and made it to the car, but before they could drive off, the group started throwing things at the car, shattering the rear and side windows. As that was happening, all of a sudden, Gemma hears Jay screaming, I'm being stabbed, I'm being stabbed. She looked over and saw Jay all twisted, kicking at the window, trying to get away as his attacker reached through the window and stabbed him repeatedly. Before she knew it, Gemma saw Jay slump back into a seat, his eyes rolled into the back of his head, and he was unresponsive. Meanwhile, another attacker had reached into the back and managed to stab Charlie in the back as well. As soon as that happened, Gemma managed to get the car started and sped off, heading to the nearest hospital in hopes of saving Jay and Charlie's lives. After the brutal attack, the group then fled, with Daniel and Charlie Dudley going their separate ways from the rest of the family all because this 20-year-old couldn't handle his own emotions and couldn't get over this girl who he had been obsessed with. After police managed to arrest all seven suspects by January of 2020, just over a year after the attack, Jay's trial for murder started. Because of how convoluted and complicated this case is, this was a rough trial for the prosecutors, all the defendants were being tried at once, and each of them had their own stories for what happened. The prosecution discussed everything that I've told you up to this point, with Daniel being obsessed with Gemma and making all of these threats against her for months, getting progressively worse and more violent after finding out Gemma had a new boyfriend. Then, to try and sort things out, Gemma tried to make amends with Daniel. She knew that he might be volatile given how he had acted in those previous meetups she had with him, so she brought some friends with, but she still had hopes that they could talk things out and make the harassment stop. 
That is why she agreed to meet up with him. But again, somehow Daniel got his entire family involved in all of this, which just as a side note, doesn't really make a lot of sense. First of all, his two parents should have been the voice of reason. Most of the time, if some, you know, late teen, early 20 year old is obsessing over their ex or can't let them go, their middle-aged parents are going to be the ones to talk them down and reassure them that this isn't the end of the world. Breakups happen. But no, these two 54-year-olds somehow joined in on this hatred. Then his sister, who, as we heard from earlier, clearly told Daniel that this relationship isn't healthy, also somehow got involved. Not only that, but her partner went along with it too. Then a cousin and a friend also got involved in the whole thing. It's just wild to me how this 20 year old convinced all of these adults to join in on this ambush against an ex, all because she moved on. It makes absolutely no sense. But regardless, all seven individuals were placed at that location via CCTV footage, cell phone data, and witness testimony. Gemma also testified at trial, again, telling the courts everything I just told you about what she had to witness. Now, based on the information we were able to gather, there is no way to definitively say who exactly landed the fatal stab to Jay. We can rule some people out, but we cannot be 100% certain on who it was. According to what Gemma said, as well as what from investigators could gather from that CCTV footage, it appeared that Anne was carrying a knife. However, based on her position while the attack was taking place, it does not appear that she physically stabbed Jay. She couldn't have. Then we know that Robert was yielding an axe while Francesca and Jamie were carrying hammers. That eliminates them as being the ones who stabbed Jay. That only leaves Daniel and his friend, Charlie. Of course, the defense in this case basically just made the whole situation sound as messy and complex as possible. Each individual had their argument for why they weren't the killer. And to me, I think the goal was just to confuse the jury as much as possible. Each suspect had their own laundry list of witnesses and evidence, which just made things really, really hard to follow. Because again, when you're having to defend six people in one trial, it's going to get really confusing to keep track of. At the end of the trial, both sides made their closing arguments. Basically, the prosecution argued that each and every one of these defendants played a part in Jay's murder and was asking for each of them to get life sentences for the murder. After this, the jury went off for deliberations and they actually deliberated for over 56 hours over the course of 11 days. Again, that just shows how much of a twisted web this trial was. The jury had so much to go over, so much to deliberate and decide on. I do not envy those jurors. In the end, 55-year-old Anne Grogan was found guilty of manslaughter and violent disorder and was sentenced to seven and a half years. 55-year-old Robert was sentenced to 14 years for manslaughter, inflicting grievous bodily harm and violent disorder. 26-year-old Charlie Dudley was sentenced to 16 years for manslaughter, grievous bodily harm, and violent disorder. Liam Hickey was sentenced to three years for wounding with intent and violent disorder. Francesca Grogan and Jamie Bennett were found guilty of violent disorder, with Francesca serving 12 months and Jamie serving 20 months. And lastly, Daniel Grogan was sentenced to life for Jay's murder with the possibility of parole after 20 years. At the sentencing hearing, the judge said that Daniel desired only to enact revenge on Jay and Gemma and was driven by self-serving anger far beyond logic. The judge said Daniel, quote, deliberately engineered a confrontation because he would not accept that Gemma wanted to be with Jay and not him. He was consumed with hatred and jealousy for a boy who had what he could not have, namely the affection of Gemma Hodder. At the sentencing hearing, Jay's mother, Sharon, also made a statement to talk about just how deeply this senseless murder has affected her and her family. She said that every single day, she closes her eyes and all she can see is Jay. This murder has caused so much pain and trauma to her and Jay's siblings, especially his younger two siblings who are just permanently scarred from this. Sharon said that her children are the only things keeping her going because otherwise this whole situation has just 
crushed her. Many people think that the sentences each individual received are far too light for the pain and suffering they all put Jay, Gemma, Charlie, and everyone else involved in this case through. Every single person in that group played a part in that murder regardless of if they actually stabbed him or not. Not a single adult in that group decided to step up and say this wasn't a good idea. No one thought to stop this. Adults, all ranging from their early 20s to mid 50s, all agreed on this ridiculous plot and took part in it, resulting in one man being severely injured and another losing his life completely and a whole lot more people being absolutely traumatized for life. This has to be one of the most ridiculous and senseless murders I've ever covered. The way this went down is just beyond belief and it was all because some 20 year old couldn't control his own emotions. I am happy that every person involved in this case at least had to serve some time, but I do agree that none of their sentences are long enough for the pain and suffering they put these families through. All I can hope is that at the end of the day, Gemma, Charlie, Jay's family, and everyone else affected by the senseless act of violence can make it through and live on. But that is all I have for today's case, and now I want to hear what you all think. What do you think of how all of this went down? How do you think Daniel got his entire family to go in on this murderous revenge plot? What do you think of the sentences each person got? Do you think they're appropriate for each person's involvement? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to use the link in the description box below to enter for your chance for a $5,000 dream vacation when you purchase your shockwave torch from Paint Safari. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Make sure you listen to my podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill up the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.